Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, we're going to read verses 19 and 20 again this morning. Do pray for us as we leave out early in the morning for youth camp in North Carolina, praying for traveling mercies. Also, Brother Dale had to slip out. Uh, he told me before church he probably would have to. He he had surgery just over a week ago and uh, still recovering from that. So keep him in your prayers as he's recovering, still recovering uh, from surgery, and ask the Lord to, to touch him. Appreciate him and Brother Neil coming today and sharing with us the work that the Gideons continue to do. I believe I saw somewhere, correct me, um, if I'm wrong on the date, Brother Neil, 1889, I believe it was, that I read, the Gideons started uh, their distribution of the Bibles in a long time, long time. So we're thankful for the work that what they continue to do. We're going to continue our series this morning, Holy, 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 Holy. We're going to talk specifically this morning about holiness and appearance, about a modest appearance. And many people will tell you that we as Christians, we have no responsibility in it, but we bear a lot of responsibility in possessing these vessels in holiness and sanctification. So let's look. Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not? your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This series, we're focusing on the importance of modesty. Last week, we dismissed some myths concerning uh, what modesty is, and we placed them with some important truths. So we looked over that. Modesty is important for both men and women. Modesty is about reflecting Jesus' glory. Modesty is about submitting to God. We understand that Jesus cares about everything that we say and do, including our personal choices. Modesty impacts every area of our lives and not just our clothing choices. There's two benchmarks that we talked about, or teachers of modesty that we spoke about last week. Jesus, the Word, and His Spirit, and the second is culture. And it does not conflict with Scripture. So today, we're going to go a little bit deeper, and we're going to focus on modesty and appearance. And then next week, we'll wrap this series up talking about how that we put that to work in our daily walk, modesty in our lifestyle. Let's ask the Lord to touch us today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your Word today. Thankful for the Word of God. Once again, it's quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is our roadmap. It is our guide to effective Christian living. And we just need your anointing today to deliver this message this morning to our congregation that we may apply it to our lives, that we may live it out and fulfill your purpose and your plan in our lives. We desire your anointing not just to preach but to receive what your word tells us, that we may put it to work in our daily walks. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I told you last week this series will be more teachy than preachy, but it's a necessity that we need to take hold of. It's important that we know what we believe, but it's also important that we know how to to live out what we believe, how to possess our vessels in holiness and what the Word of God says about it. We cannot afford to stay quiet and silent where the Word of God has much to say about it. And we can't afford to have much to say about where the Word of God seems to be silent. What does that mean? We need to focus on what God wants us to know. And God is very concerned with, it, with how we present the Word of God to society. And modesty is the way that we do that. Holy, holy, meaning completely holy. Jesus said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, and we need to be spiritual, mature, and we talked about that Wednesday night. If you did not get a chance, we're not here Wednesday night. You may want to go back on Spreaker and listen to that. We talked about uh, how that we grow in God's uh, knowledge and wisdom and understanding and how we apply the principles of God's Word in our hearts and our lives, that there's a responsibility that we have there. So as we get into this, this section of our series, uh, uh, we're going to talk about about modest clothing. 
and how it is that we are to present ourselves to the world. And as we explore this modern, uh, this modest appearance, we've got to start out with this point of clothing. People never want to hear a preacher preaching to them about clothing. Uh, but I think it's a necessity. I think too many times uh, uh, that we leave it alone. We don't say anything. Uh, and then people just think that they can dress any way they want, look any way they want, still call themselves representing. Uh, we need to be a representation. It is important what we wear. So as we look at this, we're going to start off with that. There's a culture uh, that uh, has abandoned modesty 100% completely. Uh, that's why we need to speak about it and we need to teach about it, and we need to disciple about it uh, and make sure that we have a clear understanding of what the Bible says because society has no problem telling you uh, what they think uh, you should wear, right? I've seen some crazy stuff, and, and people have said, well, culture has changed. My wife showed me a, a, uh, a video the other day of some men going down the runway, and some of uh, uh, one guy looked like a ping pong ball, the sweater that he was wearing. And so I said, well, if that's what culture is wearing. She showed me a picture of uh, two dudes uh, that are on the cabinet of our current administration uh, uh, wearing uh, skirts and fully decked out in that. And a pastor friend of mine said, what what a shame. What a horrible thing. His shoes doesn't even match his dress. And that's what, that's what society is wanting to push down our throats and, and to accept and to receive and to take. That there's, there's no difference in gender. There's no difference in, uh, and we can't tell the difference one between. And, uh, how many times have you had to double take uh, and, and ask the question? Uh, we were riding down the road the other day, and I looked over and I asked my wife. I said, was that a guy or was that a girl? I didn't actually put it that way, but I'll put it that way here. Was that a guy or was that a girl? And she said, I believe the second, but I'm not real sure. So there, there's no distinguishing between the difference, and they don't want there to be. But we have to do is go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. If you want to see what society thinks uh, uh, and how society feels about the way you dress, you just take a trip to the beach or, or that magazine rack that we talked about last week, and you'll see what is acceptable in this world. And I've told you last week, and I'll tell you again, that, listen, you don't even have to open up your Bible to understand this. You should open up your Bible, but you really don't have to. If society says it's acceptable, it's unacceptable. It's just, that's just the clear reality of where we're at in society today. And you can go to Walmart and you can see real quick uh, what society takes. If that is acceptable, I don't want to be accepted. Uh, the reality, though, is this is not a new problem. It's, it's happened ever since the fall of man. Uh, it's hap it began to happen very early in Scripture. We go all the way back uh, to find that human beings uh, have had an inaccurate understanding of what it means to be modest. Adam and Eve had a, 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 did not have a clear understanding of what it was uh, to be modest. They had no reason to because they didn't even know that they were naked. There was no reason for them to know. Uh, but when that serpent came in and the fall came, uh, there had to be some changes that took place. Uh, we read in Genesis 3, 6, and 7, it says this, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons that word apron there uh, just simply translated is a loincloth uh, you're talking tarzan and jane material here uh, and for adam and eve they said this will suffice uh, this will do so their assumption uh, even then was uh, as long as uh, the certain parts are covered uh, that they would be all right uh, and he was and they were not immodest uh, and we're fine and fig leaves will do an apron will do uh, this covering is fine but when god came looking for them, their conscience made it clear that the loincloths were not 
adequate. They were fine until God came to walk in that garden. We are the same way. We think it's fine. I'm fine. I'm dressed fine. I'm doing fine. I'm all right. But as I said last week, before you even step out of the house, step into the presence of the Lord, and you'll find out real quick it's not as fine as you thought it was. So they thought they were okay until God came on the scene. And listen to what it says in verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. This is Adam. And I was afraid because I was naked. He had on his loincloth. And it was fine for him. It was fine amongst themselves. But in the presence of the Lord. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to always be in His presence. He said, I was naked and I hid myself. There's nothing that is acceptable that causes us to have to hide from the presence of the Lord. We contrast this to the garments now that God made for them. God uh, surveys uh, uh, their appearance and what they have on and, and lets them know that they do not need to go into the clothing industry. That would not be their area of expertise. Uh, in verse 21, it tells us, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. The word coats here. Is from the Hebrew word, which means a tunic or a robe. It is the same word used to describe Joseph's coat of many colors. Uh, for comparison, uh, according to the Jewish encyclopedia, uh, it, it says that uh, it's always had sleeves, often to the wrist, and always covered the entire torso down to the entire thigh, falling below the knee, often but not always to the ankle. So these garments uh, that were worn that God made for them were very different than what was acceptable. The point is here, uh, what was acceptable even in the beginning to man was not acceptable to God. What is acceptable in our eyes, and we think, well, that's all right. Uh, that is a matter of we need to look to God. Uh, and we'll notice how God's definition of modesty is very different than ours. Uh, that's why you get mad at the preacher when he talks about modesty, when he speaks about wearing modest apparel. And you know, we'll say things like, well, that's none of your business. I, I can dress like I want to dress. I can do uh, what I want to do. That's a lot of problem with the church today is we don't want correction. Uh, we don't want God. We don't want discipleship. We don't want uh, there to be any discipline to it whatsoever. Uh, we don't want to have a clear understanding. We want to hear God say what we uh, want him to say, but many times uh, God is not saying uh, what we want him to say. God is saying something much different. Come out from among the world uh, and be ye separate. Uh, and so first of all, to be modest uh, is to make sure that we're reflecting the image of Christ and not drawing improper attention to ourselves. Our apparel must be modest. Must be modest. Now remember that God made Adam and Eve apparel that reflected his, his view of modesty. Because Adam's view did not work. Eve's view did not work. Their apparel included sleeves. It covered the torso and it covered the, th the thigh. In fact, to reveal someone's thigh or torso in the Bible is referred to as revealing someone's nakedness. Verse 10 says, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Why was he naked? Uh, because he was revealing, uh, what does it mean to be naked? It means uh, revealing parts that there, that there's no covering for it. Uh, and so Exodus 28, 42, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thigh they shall reach. Isaiah 47, verses 2 through 3. Now, I told you this is teaching because I know you weren't going to be shouting this morning. So it's, it's teaching. It's, it's something that we need to apply, that we need to consider. I can teach it. I can preach it. I can give it to you. What you do with it is up to you. In verse 2 of Isaiah 47, Take the milestones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. Uh, I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So as a Christian, as Christians, uh, we must be willing to accept that Jesus' requirement for modesty, uh, it's not culture's uh, requirements for modesty. It's not what I see in the latest trend. You may, you may pick up on uh, different styles and different name brands. That's fine. But is it modest? Is it modest? And so we have to understand that it's not about culture. It's all about pleasing the Lord. 
and they're very different. More, more, and more, it's very different. Always has been. I mean, those who have been uh, around any amount of time knows that this is not a new subject of discussion. This is something uh, that's been talked about and been preached about and been shared uh, and been a part of society for many years. Uh, uh, many times we found that it's been uh, to the place that it's been mandates, that it's been uh, 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 this is how it's going to be and this is a requirement. Uh, and what do people do about that? Uh, they usually rebel against requirements. Uh, they, they usually uh, go understand something that modesty cannot be legislated. It's not because when we do it, I shared with you this last week, uh, that you do it, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Uh, so if you're uh, just going to be modest when you're around the pastor uh, and his family and you're coming to church uh, and, and you just want to be modesty in that setting, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Uh, a heart that is hungry for God says, I just want God's will in my life uh, and I want to be a reflection of His image, uh, then we begin to see that it's for the right reason. So if a man, if a man was present today without a shirt, on, if a man was to walk in the sanctuary without a shirt on, saying, I'm ready to worship the Lord, we would probably just, you know, we would look at him. Society wouldn't think anything of it. They wouldn't consider it. When we see a man without a shirt on, we don't consider him. Society does not consider that man to be naked. My stepmom did. We come to the dinner table or breakfast table or lunch table without a shirt on. Back to your room. Put a shirt on. She said, us ladies in this house don't walk around without a shirt on. Neither should you. And so society sees no wrong in that, but that's a very different opinion when we think about what God says. So when we're, we see this, God considers that naked. If a woman was here today and she was wearing a bathing suit, a top that left little to no imagination, society would say, that's not considered naked. God would. Now, I understand that there's been some hardcore legislation, if you will, mandating, putting uh, this to effect in churches over the years that's made the word holiness be replaced with hardness. I get that. I, I have known and heard the stories of churches that it had a, a clothes closet in the back of the church, and if a woman came in wearing pants, they'd say, we've got skirts and dresses over here for you to put on before you come in the sanctuary. Uh, and I've also heard of churches that didn't have that closet. They just simply say, you're not coming in here with that on. Now, that, that's a tough. That's tough. That's a hard place, uh, and I do not agree with that at all. I believe that everyone has an opportunity and deserves an opportunity uh, to hear the gospel and that God can change their heart and God can change their life uh, and God can transition them. Uh, but once again, uh, it has to be taught in love. It has to be preached in love. It has to be shared in love. It has to be shared as the word of God. Uh, I never want to share with you my opinions, uh, but I want to take you. I want to be able to give you the scripture and the verses for it. Uh, but I need to remind you uh, that we've come so far, not just in society today, but we've come too far to the left in the church today uh, to not even want to speak about uh, modest appearance uh, listen they're going to know that uh, we are his disciples by the love that we have uh, and the care that we have and the represent representation that we bring uh, so the world or society may not consider it wrong but we don't need to consider uh, what society will accept what will god see as acceptable and obviously from the account there in genesis he said you need to put on more his ways are above our ways his thoughts are above our thoughts his definitions supersede ours. He's God. Another consideration of peril is not just that it covers us, but is it appropriate? The Bible warns us not to wear costly array. We can talk a lot about uh, wearing something that covers us up. We say, I'm, I'm covered. I'm covered. Yeah, but you could have covered about 20 other people with what you're covered with as well. So we have to look at that. Is our clothing, is it for the purpose of drawing attention to our personal wealth? Uh, to see what I can afford, see what I've got on? Uh, or is it out of line with our income level that is pleasing to Jesus? Uh, I saw something not too long ago that a, a woman says, I love it when people come up to me and they tell me, I love your dress. I love that outfit you got on. She says, yep, Goodwill, five bucks. And that's all that matters. It looks good. It's presentable. People love to tell you how much. Oh, you see this? I, I spent, 
I had somebody tell me one time, oh, this, this dress shirt, I've, I, I think they said $100 or something like that. I said, you're crazy. You're crazy. I walk around with my Middleburg Church of God dress shirts on to have that, and guys, pastors will look at it. I even had a, a general official at General Assembly a few years ago say, man, I love that shirt. Where would you get it at? I said, uh, at a, a Palaka, Florida, for 20 bucks. A Van Heusen dress shirt with our church name on it for 20 bucks. You can't beat that. You can't get a Van Heusen shirt for 20 bucks. I'm all about the deals, amen? Why is that? Because there's ministry uh, that needs our support. If you're going to go and spend $100 on a dress shirt, I'll sell you one for 10 uh, and you can give another 90 to the Gideons. How many Bibles will that get us? Uh, and so realizing there's ministry that can be done with it, uh, and that means something to God. That does not mean that we have to walk around in rags, but we need to use wisdom in our person. It's not about our personal wealth. Uh, so is it out of line with our income level? That's what's pleasing to Jesus. Uh, if, we're go if you're going in debt to buy your children's wardrobe for school, something's wrong. Even, even growing up, I wasn't in a Christian home. I, I said, Mama, I want those shoes. She said, You might want them, but you're getting those. And so when I got a job, you know, uh, I got my first job, I bought me two pair of Nikes. I bought me one pair to wear every day and other for rainy days because I was rolling then. I was in the money. I, I, could, I would pay for my, you know, that didn't last very long. I realized uh, that that money could be better used in other areas. So modesty says, perhaps I can't afford a $2,000 suit, uh, but is that going to reflect the image of Jesus? Modesty says, uh, perhaps I can afford a $1,500 pair of shoes, uh, but what is that going to say to people about my relationship with Jesus? Uh, what is that going to bring their attention to? It's going to be, uh, are you about Jesus or are you about looking money? Right? It's all right to want to look good. It's all right to, I believe that when we come to the Father's house, we should put on our best, our very best. I understand that. But we don't have to, to break the bank to do so. Yes, that's modesty. Yes, that's modesty. Of course, you can take to that to a very illogical extreme. It's not Jesus' intention for us to come up in here wearing dirty, tattered rags. And say, I'm holy. That, that's not the point. There's nothing wrong with buying clothes that you can afford comfortably within your means. But to understand something, that we have a responsibility. One man said, you want to know a man's heart? It's very easy. Look at their checkbook. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We'll find out what's in that, if anybody even keeps a checkbook log anymore. What's in that checkbook log, you'll find out where people's heart is at, what they're giving to, what they're supporting. So we've got to ask ourselves, why am I buying this? Why am I buying There's nothing wrong with looking nice, but if we're buying it for man's praise or if we're buying it to get approval, we need to see if that's a distraction that's there. And we've got to realize that I want to bring God praise. I want to bring God glory. And as Peter said, do we seek to please men or God? If I should seek, Peter said it this way, if I, we should seek to please men, we shouldn't even be called the servants of God. So why, don't, why are we doing it? Beyond the price tag, there's also the fit. Some people have a fit when pastors start talking about this. Just because they cover it does not mean it's not revealing. And just because, ladies, it's a skirt or a dress, that don't mean that it's fitting. It does not mean that it is modest. There's, there's some dresses and there's some skirts that don't leave much for the imagination. The first thing we need to look at, though, is the distinction of genders. Deuteronomy 22 and 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. People love that part of the verse, but they forget the other part. And see, a lot of, a lot of emphasis has been put on that first part for years. Didn't say much about this part. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Now we got dudes running around in skirts. 
Maybe we should have preached the second part as heavy as we was preaching the first part. We thought, well, men got it figured out. Men know how to dress, uh, but it does say both. Uh, For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Uh, God desires to see a distinction between men and women uh, in our apparel. Some would argue, but that's Old Testament teaching. That's the Old Testament. does not apply to us today. That's very dangerous direction to go to because we want to begin to argue that point of Old Testament. For example, thou shalt not murder is an Old Testament application of a principle of creation. It was never abolished, though, in the New Testament. Jesus said, I've not come to destroy, but I've come to fulfill the law. Abomination to the Lord your God is how that verse ends. God doesn't like for men to dress like women or for women to dress like men. In every culture, there's something distinctive about men and women's clothing. Yet our culture has been intent on involving the dress of one culture to the other culture. In essence, we have blurred the lines to create a unisex mode. That's where we're at, a unisex mode uh, of not just bathrooms, not just this, but even in dress, uh, a a unisex culture of how it goes and how it's supposed to go, uh, uh, and unisex in this and unisex in that. Uh, We talk about blurring gender lines that's where society has reached it's very easy to list things that man can't wear in public but it's much harder to find something a a woman cannot wear in public those lines tend to be blurred we know that in our culture in our society and uh, that that has changed over the years with the argument when we go to that verse of scripture people say well uh, they wore robes, and they, and they go into that conversation of, of how all of those things were in place. And you can argue, I'm not here to argue the points of all of those things this morning, uh, but we have to have a clear understanding of what God's Word says uh, and why. Why are women dressing uh, like men today? Uh, and, and we say, well, women had to go to work back there, uh, you know, in the time of the wars and all of that, that it was a, a movement. That was not the case. Men, women did not have to have to go to work because of that uh, but women uh, wanted equal rights they wanted to have the same rights as men uh, and they wanted to get out of their biblical lane and it was a sense of rebellion and uh, you all know what they burned I won't say it kids present but you know what all the women burned back in that time because they did that tied them to womanhood Then they traded in their skirts and their dresses for man's apparel, and they said, we need this to be in the the workplace. We need this so we can work in the mills. We need this uh, so we can uh, enter into society uh, and the workforce. Uh, That was never God's plan, never God's intention. Uh, And when we get off track from God's plan and God's intention, God laid out a very specific uh, uh, way that things were supposed to work. Uh, And I understand we're in a society today that's so far away. Uh, It's so caught up in the culture of this world. Uh, It's so caught up not just in keeping up with the Joneses, uh, but keeping food on the table uh, that we've reached a society today uh, that women have to not not only have to work outside of the home but desire Uh, I had someone tell me the other day there's no way I would stay at home Uh, there's no way I would stay at that house with those kids all day uh, that I want to go to work uh, and that's what culture has cultivated Uh, but we won't get into that discussion but I think as we begin to study the word of God that was never God's intention Uh, God never intended for that Uh, there, there's times of Proverbs, a virtuous woman, she provides and she can cares uh, for her family uh, and she does some things outside of the home, but her primary focus was in that home. If culture evolved into two distinctive modes of dress, there wouldn't be an issue. Problem is we've evolved into this unisex attire. There's been a breakdown of the concept of distinction when it comes to women. There's even been a breakdown, as we've discussed, that when it comes to men when we have to ask the question is that a man or a woman we know that we have got somewhere out of line we could argue that holiness churches are making it harder on women than on men by challenging people to dress according to cultural distinction but our culture has made it difficult because our culture has decided that men must dress distinctly male but women do not have to dress distinctively female In our culture, a skirt or a dress represents a garment that is distinctly female, or at least it used to until modern day. 
And that's where we've gotten so far from it. Many of our ladies have chosen to exclusively wear skirts and dresses. It's, that's, it's their way of honoring the distinction of genders which God has created them to be. They have looked to the Word of God. They prayed about it, and God has directed them in that fashion. In a world that is constantly deconstructing gender, gender identity, we need to make it clear and let there be a clear stand for biblical principles of distinctions. It's not about what makes me feel good. It's not about, well, I don't feel convicted of that. Uh, at some point, we've got to stake, take a stand uh, for what the Bible says and be obedient to God's Word and be obedient to what God is saying. Uh, uh, would we be willing, as we said earlier, would you be willing to give $5 for a soul to be saved? Uh, ladies, would you be willing to, to throw out all uh, all of those the, the pants and wear just skirts and dresses uh, if it will let society know there must be a distinct difference uh, between men and women. I, I'll make a deal with you, ladies. Uh, if you'll throw out all of your pants, uh, I'll throw out all my skirts and dresses. Because I don't have any. I don't have any. There's a distinction between it. Uh, we would not find that, and that's something uh, that, that we see and we hear and we know uh, that we would, we would clearly have a problem. We had a, a missionary come a, a few years ago, and he was going to Scotland, and he asked me, he said, do you think uh, the church would mind if I wore my kilt when doing my presentation? I said, buddy, you're from Middleburg. You're from Middleburg. You know... What's going to happen? If you're ready, because I'll probably be the first one in line to laugh at your legs, but you know what's going to happen when you walk up in the Middleburg, Florida with a kilt on. So we, we would be ready, right? We would have, we see a dude, if I walked up in here, would, it's, it's a kilt, not a skirt, right? This guy's going to wear me out. <laughs> but if a woman walks in with pants, we think, we think nothing of it. A man shouldn't wear that pertaining to a woman. A woman should not wear that pertaining. Well, then we go on to the argument. Well, these are women's jeans. So you have to, you have to pray about that. You have to, to see what, it, what is it? Is it? Is it a mandate? Is it a requirement? Is it it's something that we need to make a stand and say, I want to deconstruct this gender identity issue that has gone uh, a unisex uh, mentality in the world today. Why do you think the unisex mentality has gone wild? Why do you think they don't even know which bathroom to use? Uh, we want to point our finger at the Democrats, point our finger at the world. Uh, we better point back at the church where we've made all things uh, acceptable. Uh, it's not a matter of if I can do it. It's a matter of if I should do it. Uh, it's not a matter of what I'm able to do, uh, but it's a matter of what I should be doing to be a clear representation uh, of God's Word. Uh, there must be a practical application uh, for the biblical principles, and a woman choosing to wear a skirt is clear and distinct way for us to send that message uh, with that certain sound. We still believe in Bible, uh, biblical standards. We still believe that there's a distinction uh, between male and female. Uh, we believe uh, that there is a, a, a responsibility uh, for modesty appearance and adornment modest adornment is our next issue some of you are saying thank god he got off that modesty and appearance applies also to adornments first peter three chapter three verses three and four Who's adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, of course, Peter was saying, don't, he wasn't saying to us, don't do your hair. He wasn't telling you, go get your brother Jamie a haircut or brother Neil a haircut. He wasn't saying gold is bad. He wasn't telling us, don't wear clothes. No, he made clothes for Adam and Eve after the fall. But he, telling us, he, he wasn't telling us this till we would walk around with our hair down, naked, wear all the silver we wanted to. But what Peter was emphasizing here is that we're not to adorn ourselves in a way that brings and attracts attention away from Jesus and says, look at me. Look at me. Bringing attention to myself. Peter and Paul were in agreement on this because we see nearly identical instructions when Paul writes to young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and 9. 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, or pearls of costly array. People tend to adorn themselves with tattoos, makeup, and jewelry, and put all of those things on. For what? To bring attention. I told our young men last week, if you're dating a girl that wears a lot of makeup, make sure she takes it off before you exchange those vows. Because you want to know what you're going to wake up to that first morning. It's all right when she's getting prepared for today in her own house. But when you roll over and you said, I do, it's done. You can't go to the courthouse and say, I want to divorce her because she's a lot uglier than I thought she was. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. So there, there's a reflection A deceit almost that comes in some of the things that people put on to make themselves look in a way that they really don't. Now, let's look at each one of these for just a moment. There's the heart issue before we dive deeper. There's a heart issue. That's what we have to look at. But above all, all of this hinges upon a heart issue. We are made in the image of God. We've been fashioned by His hands. And so why is the real reason that I need, feel the need to decorate myself? That, that's what we have to think about, the, the heart issue. Perhaps it's for expression. Now, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with this explicitly. There's nothing wrong with expressing ourselves. There is expression with the parameters of God's Word. We have a responsibility to express uh, the loving characteristics of God. But I also believe that you don't have to have a T-shirt that says Jesus saves on uh, or to say I'm born again to let people know you're born again. If it takes the bumper sticker on the back of your car or the T-shirt you're wearing uh, for people to know you're safe, we need to check the heart. But also, when we find that uh, we're bringing things to bring attention to ourselves, uh, as we need to check the heart. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. Uh, so pa- perhaps it's the inadequacy of, of the things that we see. We feel that we're blemished or we're bland, and we've got to enhance our appearance. Now, I've heard some say, uh, and they're trying to be funny with it, on the other side of it is every old barn needs a coat of paint every now and then. I'm not married to an old barn. We need to surrender all of our inadequacies. Problem, we don't want to cover up the root problem. We want to deal with the root problem. We need to surrender that uh, and, and instead of hiding it from God. We need to come to Him. Perhaps it's to be more attractive. Certainly there's nothing wrong uh, with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be attractive. Uh, but to what are we attracting? What kind of attraction? He said, let it be the godly character of a, of a woman's heart or a man's heart that attracts we need to make sure that, that attraction is there and and to understand that we're not doing that for the wrong reason or why we're we trying to attract people are we attracting people to the beauty of god or are we seeking affirmation for ourselves it's all about the appearances Keeping up appearances is what people would call it. Perhaps it's the sediment. we feel an emotional connection to something which we adorn ourselves with And then we have this problem with the boundaries of Scripture. After all, Jesus did tell us uh, to leave our father and mother, etc., and follow him. I worked with this girl one time at Publix, and she had a ring on every finger. I'm talking thumb. Every finger except for one. And I went to school with her. I went to to high school with her. This was after uh, high school. Well, she was still in high school. I I got done with it a little bit earlier than everybody else because I quit. But... We were working together, and, and I knew her well, and I said, called her by name. I said, you, got, you need to go get you another ring. That one finger's missing a ring. She said, oh, no, it's in the shop. So she had a ring for every finger. I thought, why do you wear so many rings? I didn't tell her it looked hideous, but I wanted to. I was just trying to get an understanding of, of why she had a ring on every finger. And she said, they all mean something to me. This was this, and this is grandma gave me this. And, this. and if, if we're not careful, we'll do that. And we'll say, well, I wore, I wore this necklace because it belonged to, to my great-great-grandmama, and this one because so-and-so gave it to me this. And before you know it, you look like Mr. T. But they all, they all 
have a reasoning behind it. And before you know it, we're doing it all. When people see us, uh, when that, that's, I just brought that up. I said, you look like Mr. T. Because so, how is he remembered? Because he's wearing all of those neck. So it brought attention uh, to uh, the apparel that he was wearing, uh, the haircut that he had. Uh, and people look at that, and that attention is drawn to him. Uh, and so how are we known? I, I don't want to be known with the guy with all the jewelry. I want to be the guy that's representing Christ. I don't want to be known uh, uh, as the girl. Girl, or you don't want to be known as the girl that's dressed this way that has all this on, uh, but the one that told me about Jesus. Uh, and so uh, that's important how we do that. Uh, and though it's uh, within the boundaries of Scripture, Jesus did tell us to leave all of those things to follow him. So when it, then we come to the subject of tattoos, and Scripture's clear on that. Somebody asked me for a verse on that the other day, and it's clear in, in several places, but the most notable is Leviticus 19 and 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, for the dead, nor print any marks upon upon you, I am the Lord. And I think Brother Eddie Sullivan put it best when he was preaching camp meeting here a couple few years ago, and he said that you wouldn't want anybody to come up in your house and paint all kinds of pictures on your wall. So why would you do that to God's house? You know you're not that you're the temple of God. Now, of course, a tattoo is a permanent mark upon the skin. There's nor- normally done for the sake of expressing individuality, but Jesus has already stamped us with individuality. He, his fingerprints, it's about his DNA, not ours. And the Bible ex- expressly forbids making marks on the skin, and the Bible generally admonishes us that our bodies belong to God, not ourselves. It's clear instruction from Scripture uh, that we're to avoid getting tattoos. That's, uh, that is very clear in Scripture. But what if you already have one? All you can do at that point is look to God and ask Him, what do I do now? You pray about it. Perhaps He wants you to have them removed. That can get costly. But if God says do it, He'll make a way. Maybe he wants them removed. Or it could be that God wants uh, that they will be a testimony of where God has brought you from and what he has done. And now there, there are certain tattoos. I knew a man uh, who was uh, a holiness preacher, and he would, he would preach against everything that moved. If it wasn't nailed down, he was going to preach against it. He was very, very strict in, in preaching against women's apparel and everything else. But he would wear a short sleeve shirt that exposed his tattoo that he got when he was in the world of a naked woman. Cover that up. <coughs> That's not a testimony to anybody. Cover it up. We, we understand that there's places that we have. So God could be using it for a testimony and for the sake of finances. For those who have tattoos, say, Lord, please let me use them for a testimony. But he'll make a way if he wants you. To, and you have to pray about that. That's between you or God, you and God. You say, well, I have tattoos, and, and I, I've got tattoos now. Does that make me not saved? No, God saved you. God saved you. You came to the Lord, and you were divorced, and, and, and then you come to the Lord. You, you come to, to the Lord, and you had a child out of wedlock. You're still saved. He saved you. He redeemed you. Uh, but you have to say, God, uh, this is what I have brought. This is what I bring into this new relationship with you. How is it to be used for your glory? What, what's the best way for me to express myself now that I have been born again? Because obviously, uh, if I was in right relationship with you, I would have done none of these things. Uh, but now I'm thankful for your grace uh, that Brother Kevin was talking about this morning. No matter how far and how the longer we're away from God, the more of the world that we put on. That's why I pray hard when somebody goes back on the Lord, because the longer they're gone, the more the world's going to mark them up. And I've seen people that they come back, and, uh, man, they're just marked up by the world. But God's grace, God's mercy, he begins to guide them and direct them. I can always tell the ones that's hungry for God and hungry for his word because there's distinctions and there's changes and there's questions and there's growth. On the subject of makeup, people say, no, we don't want to talk about that. Well, we will. We will. Makeup and cosmetics are always mentioned negatively in the Bible. It's often used as a symbol of Israel's spiritual falling away. The most resounding statement the Bible makes against cosmetics is through the life of a woman that nobody wants to be like. Nobody says, I want my daughter to grow up and be just like her. And as far as I know... I don't know anybody that's named their daughter this, Jezebel. 
Nobody wants, and that's when you begin to tie. Jezebel was not just a person. She was a representative person. Much like Joseph was a type of Christ, Jezebel represented seduction, spiritual harlotry. She was uh, very well known in the Old Testament, but you know what? She's brought up again in Revelation. She wasn't gone. Her, her reputation stayed, stayed there and stuck there. She, Jezebel had a king for a husband who had no backbone. And he didn't get what he wanted, so he cried to Jezebel. And Jezebel, she's the one that wrote the letter to Elijah. said, I'll take your life. The threats. Her getting out of her lane. Her doing. We, we find, we look in the book of Esther, and we see that king and how he put his wife away and put her out because she tried to uh, rebel against what he said to do. But that king said, he may not have been a godly king, uh, but he said, I'm not going to deal with that. And he put her out uh, because she represented the kingdom. Uh, Ahab didn't do that. He had Jezebel, and Jezebel uh, ran the kingdom. Uh, and if a woman's running the house, there's a problem. That's not biblically right. Not biblically right. We used to say, who wears the pants in the family? Well, we both do, is where we're at today in society. But did she use this, this harlotry uh, that was discussed even in Revelation as a symbol of God's hatred uh, for this conduct in Revelation 2 and 20, if you want to look it up when you get home. Uh, her, her seductive look came through cosmetics and jewelry, 2 Kings 9 and 30. God was concerned Israel would make an idol out of her tomb, so he had dogs devour her carcass in 2 Kings 9, 35 through 37. So in contrast to this, we have, as I just mentioned, uh, Esther. Now, Esther was very different from Jezebel. Je Esther had a different presentation of what it was to be modest. And we find that Esther showed a spirit of God's grace. And she stood before the Persian king. She was allowed to use anything that she wanted to to beautify herself. In Esther 2 and 13, but what did she choose? Perfume, oils for her skin, Esther 2 and 12. Cosmetics are being used to alter the appearance, eyeshadow, lipstick, etc. This is clearly something that is spoken about negatively in Scripture. It does not reflect the image of Christ. Finally, on the modesty front, we come to jewelry. Jewelry is not as black and white in scriptures as we see God's people wearing jewelry at times in the Bible. The Bible talks about God's people wearing jewelry in some positive ways. In fact, God blessed his people with jewelry from Egypt as they left the promised land for the promised land. But there's a disturbing trend that took place. They begin to use the blessings as a way of expressing pride and sensuality. Moses goes to the mountain. What do they do? They take all of that, and there's a golden calf. That they form out of it. They begin to use these blessings as a way of expressing that. It's all culminated with their jewelry being melted down and forged into that calf while Moses was there on that mountain. God commanded them to prove their repentance by permanently removing their jewelry. Exodus 33 and 5 and 6. For the Lord hath said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You stiff-necked people, I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thine ornaments from thee, that I may know uh, what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel, Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. Remember, the promised land is not a type of heaven. It's a type of God's provision for us here on earth. In other words, uh, to walk in the promised land is to experience God's favor. So eventually, God specifically expressed his hatred for jewelry because of its connection with idolatry in Deuteronomy 7 and 25. So there are many other passages that we can look at to demonstrate God's disdain for jewelry uh, as a means of adornment. He asked them to remove it uh, over and over again. He saw them wearing it uh, as a sign of backsliding. The Bible does specifically make allowances for jewelry. Uh, we can see that the functions of the adornment. Joseph, Mordecai, Daniel, they wore 
were signet rings. They were their signature. That's how they signed for. Uh, the prodigal son, when he came home, the, the ring was placed upon his finger. That was the signet ring of his father. Uh, the breastplate of the high priest contained precious stones that represented Israel's uh, 12 tribes. Jewelry was uh, used as a wedding token in Bible times. Genesis 24, Isaiah 61, Jeremiah 2. Uh, to what conclusions, though, can we come about jewelry? Jewelry uh, with a functional use can be modest as long as it's reasonable. Wedding bands, military dog tags, medical bracelets, watches. There are any of those, of course, that's not overly extravagant. They serve purpose. At the same time, jewelry that is simply worn for adornment can become problematic. Ultimately, there is a subject. This is a subject that you've got to pray about and you've got to be led by the Spirit about. I've never, I'm never, ever stand in this pulpit and preach to you my convictions. Never, ever do I stand in this pulpit and tell you this is the way I want it, so this is the way it's going to be. But I do tell you that we need to take a closer look at what the Bible says about being holy, holy. Because how we apply God's Word to our life is demonstrated in our expression. We have to look and we have to wonder uh, why when I enter into the house of God that I'm not entering into His presence with thanksgiving. I'm not entering into His courts with, uh, with praise. Uh, because maybe, just maybe, God's dealt with you in some of these areas and you've not been obedient. There are things that is found in the Word of God that is very clear. And there is other things that God begins to deal with individuals, as we talked about last week. I have personal convictions. Personal convictions that even uh, it may be different within our home. My wife wears a wedding band. I don't. I can't. I don't know why. I just don't feel right wearing one. Personal convictions that, that we have, that I have. And I just do whatever God deals with me to do. And that's what you've got to do. Deal with, let God deal with you. And you have to, to consider. See, a lot of times, a lot of times when we get into discussion on modesty and apparel, right? I've been here 10 years almost. You know I never do anything, say anything to purposely hurt anyone. But also, I have a responsibility to teach you God's Word. It's not, just, it's not enough just to preach real good and get a lot of amens and get a pat on the back and say, man, I appreciate you, Pastor, because you preached and all of heaven came down. But when we slow down a little bit and we say, well, the Bible does say this. Oh, I didn't want to hear that. That don't make me shout. I love it when you shout. But I guarantee you when we begin to get things in order, there'll be a lot more shouting. Shouting Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets. All, everywhere we go. So, as we're at the heart of this subject. We'll conclude next week. As you stand with me, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there any area that Pastor covered on modesty today that was discussed that I struggle with? Is there any area of what I mentioned and gave you Scripture for that's been a struggle for you? Ask that question. And then you have to do something. Why am I struggling in that area? Am I open? See, many times when we get on the subject, when we hear this kind of preaching, this kind of teaching, you get real quiet like you are right now. Because Jesus is dealing with you about modesty. He's dealing with you and he's speaking to you. Paul told Timothy, he said, hold fast to that that you've learned, and you know who you've learned it from. So this isn't some stranger off the street, some, some evangelist that was brought in to tell you we need to be holy, holy. This is the one you look to on a weekly basis to be a spiritual guide and a shepherd to you. And I don't take that responsibility lightly. 
And God placed this upon my heart, said, share this. We've talked about modesty, but I felt a need to go, go deep into this. Several months ago, it's on my heart, been preparing this. We've got to ask myself, ourselves, why am I struggling with that? And ask ourselves this also, am I open to the Lord dealing with me about modesty in my appearance? Am I willing to commit? Am I willing, are you willing to commit? You may say, Pastor, I don't line up with everything you preach this morning, but are you willing to commit yourself to prayer about it? Say, okay, I know what Pastor said, and I know what was preached, and I know what was taught this morning. And I'm not just going to shut it off and say that's just his opinion. I, thank you, Pastor, but I'll stay the way I am. But would you say I'll commit myself to pray about it, to study God's Word about it? There's plenty of studies that you can find that talks about our appearance. People don't want to look at them. They don't think they're relevant for today. But they are. Because church has not made it relevant for today, society is where it's at today. So we have a responsibility to turn this thing around. I told you last week God's just been running that over and over my spirit. I'm turning this thing around. You know where he starts? Right here with hard, hard positions like right now when you're looking at me and don't know if you want to love me or be mad at me because I got in your business this morning. My dad would have yelled out from the back, you're meddling now. I'm not trying to meddle. I'm trying to help you to be the best representation of Christ that you possibly can be because this world needs us. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. What you do with us today is between you and the Lord. But would you at least do that say, Pastor, I'm willing to pray about it. I'm willing to come with an open heart before the Lord. Say, Lord, whatever you have me to do, I'm going to do it. Father, I love you today. I thank you today. I've, I've shared my heart. I know that I fall short in areas myself. And I never want to preach to others and find myself a castaway, and I never want to stand up here like I've got it all together. Because, Lord, I need you. As I said before, I lean heavy on you, Lord. I depend on your grace and your mercy daily to lead me and guide me and direct me that I may be a shepherd to this people that you've placed me, placed them in my care. These are your sheep. They're your people, but you've made them my responsibility. And I pray, Father God, that the word that I've dealt and gave today will be something that they consider in prayer. Make needed adjustments, all of us. There's some things that I need to take to prayer as well and make needed adjustments. As we gather in these altars today, I pray, God, that you'd help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. How many will join me in the altars today saying, I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider these things in prayer? Some areas there I'm struggling with. Some areas there that you mentioned that I don't necessarily agree with, but I'm willing to pray about them. Will you step out? Will you come? Will you find your place in prayer? And ask the Lord to guide you in his spirit.